Esther chapter 5. Comedians had a field day with President George W. Bush's reputation for mispronunciation. Take the word nuclear, for example. President Bush pronounced it nuclear, which I think I do. I've, I've done that so many times now, I don't know what the correct pronunciation really is. On October 7th in the year 2000 on Saturday Night Live, Will Ferrell impersonated then-candidate for President George Bush and used the word strategery. As a result, some people believe Bush actually used the word, which I don't think he did. Uh, but uh, I, I like that word. And our text in Esther reveals some excellent strategery on the part of God. We've seen that though Mordecai and Esther did not start out walking with God at all, the Lord had moves and counter moves that put them in a position to decide whether to be used by Him or not. God was going to save His people with or without Esther and Mordecai. They might as well get on board with His strategy and be a part of the victory. Now, we're picking up this, uh, in the midst of the story, obviously. Queen Esther had just invited the king and Haman to a banquet. Haman is the guy who had the king uh, create the decree to destroy and exterminate the Jews. And, and so Esther uh, has the king's ear, and she invited them to a banquet. And Haman was feeling quite special. And so in verse 9 of chapter 5, Haman went out that day joyful and with a glad heart, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and called for his friends and his wife Zeresh. And then Haman told them of his great riches, the multitude of his children, everything in which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and servants of the king. Moreover, Haman said, because Queen Esther invited no one but me to come in with the king to the banquet that she prepared, and tomorrow I am again invited by her along with the king. Haman could give quite an impressive inventory of his life in Persia. Uh, but we would say, from our vantage point, what was it worth compared to his eternal soul? And so this, you know, this is the worldly man who is achieving worldly goals uh, that are obviously fleeting. He's, he's going to have a pretty big crash here in just a few verses. Uh, but um, it, you can see in these reliefs in Scripture just how, um, how fleeting the world really is uh, compared to eternity. As Christians, obviously, we should be more excited about investing than in our inventory. You should take the resources God has given you and invest them as He uh, tells you for eternity. Um, so whatever it is, that's between you and the Lord. We don't talk a lot about this as far as percentages or anything like that. But um, really, the idea is that I don't need much of an inventory on earth. I need to be investing in heaven uh, and thinking about uh, meeting the Lord. Uh, verse 13 Yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. The world wants us to focus on a goal, and it promises us that once it's achieved, we're going to be satisfied and content. <clears throat> it's kind of the carrot on the stick. The goal or the end of man is to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, Mordecai, he actually, or uh, Haman, he has a lot. He's achieved a lot from a worldly standpoint. Uh, he's in a good position in the government. He's in good standing with the king. Everything seems to be going all right. But he just can't get by this one last thing, he thinks. <clears throat> and it's Mordecai. And, and I remember being in the world before you're a Christian. There's always one more hump that you have to get over. There's always, you know, that next level. Because you find that once you get to where you thought you were going to be satisfied you're still not satisfied. There's, and you think, well, then my goal must have been wrong. Uh, maybe if I go further, get more, have more, uh, and, and, of course, you end up building bigger barns and all of that kind of thing, and um, it, it, it all fails. <clears throat> and so this was his big thing, is, is if I could just get through this situation and kill all the Jews, then I will be happy. 
And um, it's, it's a terrible goal, but um, it, it, that's what he was thinking. So verse 14, then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. Then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. Um, must have been like, you know, Gallows Incorporated or something. I mean, because they built it pretty quick. I mean, where do you, I, there must have been gallows makers. But the, his wife, they, he mentions his wife specifically and his friends. I would sleep with one eye open if Zeresh was my wife. I mean, because she goes right to it. She goes, well, have a gallows made and have the guy hung on there for everybody to see. That's what I think you should do. Hey, honey, what's in my soup? You know, I mean, you don't want, you don't want this gal getting on the wrong side. So this is brutal, but in a, I don't want to say it's the same today, but don't tell me the world isn't just as cruel now as it was then. Not that people are building gallows upon which to hang you. They would if they could, believe me. But it sure feels like it when you get blindsided at work by your coworkers and find out there are all manner of evil plots against you. After all, you might be in someone's way and it's a dog-eat-dog -dog on the way up to the ladder of success kind of a world. Uh, and so all of you who are in the work world or, you know, have had a job or anything like that, even in school, um, You've, you've faced these kinds of people. They're just brutal people that are willing to do anything to get ahead at your expense. And, of course, if you're a Christian, uh, they're going to point that out as well. Meanwhile, King Ahasuerus couldn't get to sleep. This is interesting. In chapter 6, that night the king could not sleep. So one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. Uh, it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Well, nothing's been done for him. So there was a short note about this earlier in Esther, and I told you to remember that, that Mordecai had overheard this plot and he had saved the king's life. Now you find out that nothing ever came of that. And so Ahasuerus can't sleep, uh, and that's from God. That's part of God's strategy. Have you ever been woke up in the middle of the night and, and think, what's going on? You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sleeper. I don't know about you. Maybe you're a light sleeper. Maybe you have trouble getting to sleep. I can sleep anytime, anywhere. Um, I almost have to stay standing up all the time, and I'm working on sleeping standing up. I mean, I just, I don't know if it's I'm overtired, if I have narcolepsy or whatever, but I, I'm a sleeper. And when I go to sleep at night, that's it. It's over. And, and so sometimes I get calls in the middle of the night. If you ever call me in the middle of the night, which you can, I don't mind, but it, I'm not really awake for 10 minutes. And so I'll be talking on the phone, and Pam, who's a light sleeper, she'll say, honey, are you awake? Yeah, of course I'm awake, and I, I, but I'm not. And so... Uh, yeah, I'm in some kind of a trance state between sleep and waking, and, and uh, uh, anyway, it's, it's just crazy. And so if I ever wake up in the middle of the night, it's from God. There's something going on, something I need to pray about or something like that. And so Ahasuerus wasn't, obviously wasn't a believer, wasn't a Jew, wasn't a Christian, didn't know the Lord, but God uh, figured out some way of troubling his heart so that he couldn't sleep that night. We don't, we don't know what it was. Maybe there was a noise outside or who knows. Uh, now, maybe he had other nights that he couldn't sleep. He says, hey, bring me the book of Chronicles, you know, of, of the king and stuff, and that'll do it. That's, that's his way of counting sheep, you know. There, and some of you, you have a way of trying to get back to sleep. But he just happened to read in the record this story of Mordecai, and um, uh, it, he it jogged his attention, and he said, well, what did we ever do for that guy? He saved my life. We probably should have given him a plaque or, you know, a ribbon or something like that. And he said, well, actually, we, we didn't do anything for him, and so now he's working on this. Uh, and so now we're starting to see God's strategery, because you remember last week we saw how that um, Esther is worried about going to the king because if he doesn't receive her, she could be uh, uh, executed. And so he receives her and he says, whatever you want, 
I'll do for you up to half of my kingdom. And then she says, I want to invite you to a banquet, and just you and Haman. And then she does another banquet on top of that. And you're scratching your head thinking, what kind of weird strategy is that? But now you see that God was leading that because he had all this in mind. Uh, he's first going to shame Haman, uh, and then he's going to deal with him very directly. And so verse 4, so the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court. So the king's up all night. He's at a sleepless night, and, and now it's morning, and Haman can't wait to get there to suggest his plan, remember, to hang Mordecai on the gallows. And so this is, this is fantastic drama, you know. It, it's just like Shakespeare, only ten times better. And so Haman's coming in to say, I want to hang Mordecai, and the king is, is just realized that Mordecai needs to be honored, and they don't know this. The two of them are at odds. So he says, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai in the gallows that he had prepared for him. The king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the court, and the king said, oh, let him come in. Sense of timing here is superb. Uh, and, and that's a, a ministry to us as well right there. Remember that when God's work in your life seems delayed, he's waiting for just the right moment to further the action. That's so hard. I don't like that. Uh, there's so many times when it seems like, I mean, as you look back, those of you who've been Christians for a while, not a long while, but some of you a real long while, and you look back and you think, man, there were... It seems like there were decades when I didn't know what God was doing in a certain area of my life. And then all of a sudden, things change dramatically and rapidly, things that you, you, you had no idea uh, how God was going to work that out. In fact, you had gotten into a despair even thinking, I, I don't see this ever working out. There's no way you're going to remove this problem or move me over here or whatever it might be. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and it's completely dealt with. Maybe you're in a situation right now that is stressful. And you just don't see the way out. Um, God is working behind the scenes and he has a perfect timing that will give glory to him. And, and we, a lot of times we don't see that because we don't wait long enough for him to reveal himself. We, in the freedoms that we have in our country and with the resources we have, we can make moves on our own. And many times we, we do that. We think, well, I don't really have to stay at this job. I don't have to stay at this school. I don't have to stay at this church. I don't have to stay in this marriage. Unfortunately, people take it that far sometimes. And we make moves on our own, and then we ask God to bless them. And sometimes God is just saying, hey, just wait. It's all going to work out because uh, I work all things together for the good. And so hang in there. God has a timing uh, that is absolutely wonderful and perfect. And when his reveal comes, it's, it's startling and amazing. And so verse 6, so Haman came in and the king asked him, what should be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And so this is, this is fantastic. It would be funny if it wasn't for the fact that he's going to be hung here in a little while. And Haman answered the king, for the, man, uh, for the man, excuse me, whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought out which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man uh, whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Now, we know what's going to happen, but Haman is describing a fantasy of his. This is his fantasy moment where um, he's like, wow, the king is going to honor me, so I've thought about it. I mean, this is well thought out. He's thought about this. He's had dreams, daydreams about it. He's a daydream believer when it comes to this, you know. It's like, I see myself with the king's robe on the king's horse being led along by the king's herald with everybody looking at me thinking how special I am. And, and it prompted me to just ask us all, what do we find ourselves actually daydreaming about? We should exercise our minds to be daydream believers in the sense that our daydreams are about sharing the gospel or some other spiritual activity in which we would decrease while Jesus increases. Uh, so if you're going to daydream, get control of those things uh, so that you're not so lifted up but so that you're uh, humbled and serving the Lord. Uh, verse 10, then the king said to Haman, 
Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, and do this for Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done <laughs> to the man whom the king delights to honor. I, I mean, he couldn't have done this with much joy. That's the only, the only thing he had left is to be a little bit depressed about it. Uh, and so, man, Haman's plans are unraveling just as God's providence was being revealed. And uh, throughout, there's a whole sub-theme, of course, through here of just how incompetent King Ahasuerus was. I mean, just a, a little while earlier, he had signed a decree allowing Haman to exterminate all the Jews, and yet he knows that Mordecai is a Jew, and now he wants to honor him because it's in the records. And so this guy... He's like maybe the worst leader that Persia ever had. Uh, and, um, you know, maybe it was an inbreeding. I don't know. But he just, he's just not firing on all cylinders. And so verse 12, afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried to his house mourning and with his head covered. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but it will surely fall before him. While they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Now, wait a minute. They already knew that Mordecai was a Jew. That's what this whole thing was about. And that's how Haman's hatred for Mordecai began. A moment ago, this same wife and these same friends had encouraged Haman to build a gallows upon which to hang Mordecai. Now they're saying that, well, Mordecai's invincible. There's nothing you can do to that guy. Well, this is an example of getting worldly counsel. People often tell you what you want to hear. Uh, their counsel is both yes and no. They, they are struggling to figure out what it is you want to hear, and, and they kind of, you know what I'm talking about. They'll even test the waters a little bit. They'll say something, and then once they see your reaction, then they kind of veer into the direction that you want to go. It's, it's uh, a couple of things here. Number one, don't seek out worldly counsel. There's plenty of counsel in God's Word. This is something, I mean this with all my heart. I, you're going to think I'm just lazy and don't want to have counseling appointments, but... You are your own best counselor if you're in the Word. Uh, just go to the Word. It's not hard. Uh, you know, get a topical Bible if you need one and, and look at, you know, identify what it is you're going through and let the Word counsel you. Then go to people who are solid Christians. And when you do, be open-ended. Don't, you know, people always come and they say, they're looking for counsel, but they say, you know, I've been praying about this, and God has told me to do this. What do you think? Well, uh, what am I going to say? Well, if God told you to do it, I think he's wrong. Uh, uh, here's what I have to say. You know, and so, but, uh, so my technique when people do that and what they're doing is wrong is this, I just say, hey, God didn't tell you that. I don't know who you're listening to, but God didn't tell you that because he can't. He can't tell you to do something contrary to his word, and that's what you're, you're saying. Uh, you, you know, and most of the counseling you end up doing is marriage counseling at some level, and people have already decided that they don't belong to each other for, you know, they, they got married wrong or they were the wrong people or, you know, that kind of a thing. And, and so, you know, you have, to, you have to say, well, yeah, I don't know who you've been listening to, but it's not God because he can't contradict his word. Uh, and so, and, you know, sometimes it's just hard to give godly counsel uh, because people don't like to receive it. I mean, sometimes it can be an iron sharpens iron situation. And uh, people, you know, everybody, th all of us think that we're, you know, we're pretty bulletproof, you know. I, I don't know how many people have told me, I can take it, just give it to me straight. All right, you're an idiot. <laughs> well, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I'm leaving the church, I don't have, you're, you know, what kind of a pastor are you? I said, I'm the pastor that told you the truth because you said you wanted the truth. So, I mean, what do you want from me? You want me to sugarcoat it? You might be an idiot, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, I never call anybody an idiot. But, you know, sometimes I sit there like everybody, and I think, oh, Lord, I don't want to say this. Why does it have to be me? You know? And so I'll say, I'll say uh, what does any of uh, your good friends, you know, what have they said to you? 
And then sometimes, they, well, they told me I was wrong. Yeah, they're right. Go with that. I'm, I'm with them. I'm in that group. But a lot of times they'll say, oh, I went there and they said uh, what I'm thinking is just fine, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. So anyway, don't get worldly counsel. You don't need it. Um, just seek the Lord for counsel. And if you're still not sure, seek godly counsel and really be open to it and pray about it. See if it's really, you know, if it lines up. God wants to give you wisdom from above. He's not withholding counsel. Uh, it's, it's that sometimes we've made up our minds and then we look for somebody who will agree with us. And believe me, you can find people to agree with you. Uh, a lot of times we're in situations and people say, well, look, you know, let's poll everybody. I said, it doesn't matter. You can't take a vote because when it comes to it, people draw back. And they say, well, you know, I, I don't really, I don't want to lose a friend or, you know, I don't want to, I, I hate confrontation. You know that? Well, of course you hate confrontation. Everybody hates confrontation. If you like confrontation, you need to be confronted <laughs> because there's, there, you've got a problem. But anyway, so uh, I love this. They say, hey, build a 50-foot gallows. Oh, man, you're in so much trouble. <laughs> I mean, what did you do that for? And uh, they're all backpedaling. Everything is now set up for the final act of this drama. God has been readying things behind the scenes. If you will receive it, I suggest that God does the same thing for you. He is constantly working behind the scenes, readying things in your life. You and I don't see it because we think our lives are too insignificant for God to be that involved. But he is. I'm sure God is working behind the scenes of my life because in his word, he tells me that he loves me just as much as he loves his own son, Jesus Christ. Often Christians are described in the Bible as God's beloved. And that means you are loved by God the Father just as much as Jesus is loved. My life may, uh, and your life may not seem as dramatic as Esther's and Mordecai's. Uh, and, and that's because it's not. Uh, we, we weren't at this time and this juncture in history, uh, but God is no less interested in how our lives pan out and work out, and He's working in and through them if we will let Him. So one act remains in the palace. Chat, we'll get into chapter 7 a little bit. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. Uh, I doubt that Haman had much of an appetite, but he's committed now. And on the second day, at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me, that's my petition, and my people at my request. For we have been sold, my, for it, we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. Oh, man. You know, you don't have to talk for a long time to say stuff that is absolutely profound. Uh, I, there's a story, those of you who are educators would know this better, but there's a story about the Gettysburg Address. Uh, it's how long? It's like four or five minutes long, not even, you know, four score and seven years ago. And um, I think Lincoln was, he wasn't the keynote speaker. There was another guy who spoke for like a, a, two or three hours, you know, because that's all people had to do in those days. And I, none of us remember who that guy was or anything he said, but we remember what Abraham Lincoln said. So you can say a lot using a few words. This is obviously God speaking through Esther. This is one of those situations where you get into the New Testament where, you know, Jesus said, hey, don't worry about what you're going to say when you're before kings and governors. I'll tell you what to say. And so this is, uh, this is just Esther depending on God. She's only been walking in obedience to God for just a few days. I mean, we've developed how disobedient and how out of the will of God she was up until this crisis. She's only been, a, we would say, a Christian for a short time, but she speaks with absolute spiritual power and finesse. Uh, you can't change one word of this. This is perfect. Wherever you are in your walk, God can speak through you to others. He really can. 
It's not a matter of oratory or of language or, you know, what, you know, learning the word of the day or anything like that. However you communicate, if you're a Christian, you can communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you're in a tough situation, you can depend on the Holy Spirit to give you words to say. And so King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? Stupidest king ever. <laughs> I mean, he's, he actually doesn't see what's happening. He, he missed the big reveal. That was like the crescendo reveal where he should have looked at Haman and said, Wow. And he's like, Who is he? When did, when did that happen? And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and queen. How does a guy like this get to be king? Haman suggested the extermination of the Jews, but Ahasuerus had implemented it by signing it into law. He's the one that signed the decree. Often you are correct in your assumption that it's hard to soar with eagles when you work with turkeys. Do you, do you remember that old saying? I love those stupid sayings. But anyway, your responsibility is to submit to the authority God has allowed to be placed over you right up to the point it would cause you to disobey God. And so Ahasuerus, bad king, he's not even really figuring out what's going on while it's actually happening before him. Uh, you know, you and I, are, we're reading the story and we think, well, that's the moment that, he, that it all comes together. But actually, there has to be a, a subplot where Esther actually explains it. Well, let me explain it to you, you know. Haman made you, you know, and stuff. And so she lets him know. And so verse 7, Then the king rose in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went to the palace garden. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen out there, but uh, he feels like he needs to look at his plants for a few minutes before he can respond. But Haman stood before Queen Esther pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the palace of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was, and the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And so Haman appears to be openly assaulting Esther. It's interesting as a dramatic device because he had been secretly assaulting Esther by calling for the extermination of the Jews, and so now King Ahasuerus could see what was plotted in secret. He, it was being played out before him. This was an assault on his queen, on the Jews, uh, and he could see it. There are no real secrets, you know, when dealing with God. There's that scripture, be sure your sin will find you out, and it will unless it's confessed, and then God describes it as being cast into the depths of the sea. And so uh, let's deal with sin uh, radically and immediately so that uh, it doesn't come back and bite us. Now, Harbona, one of the king's eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, happens to be standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. I like Harbona. He has a small but, uh, but significant part, and that describes most of us. We have small but significant parts in the flow of the gospel, in what we like to call Acts 29. You know, Acts ends 28 chapters, but it never really ends because it's the acts of the Holy Spirit through the church of Jesus Christ on earth. And so, so um, all of us have small but significant parts to play. Uh, what I get from him is that he was attentive. Even though living probably confined within the palace, he knew all about Haman's plans and Haman's gallows, and when the king needed advice, he was able to give it insightfully. And so he, you know, he, he, was, he was a guy who knew what was going on. He knew the times, he knew the people, he knew the situations. And so when the king, who was a king that needed a lot of help, uh, when this king needed help, Harbona could give him good counsel. He says, Haman, basically he's saying Haman was going to hang Mordecai on this gallows, and now we see that, you know, really he should be hung on it. And so let me just make this suggestion to you. A lot of ministry can take place if you learn to pay close attention. A lot of ministry suffers when you don't pay close enough attention. A lot of us have had the experience, and this isn't the biggest thing in the world, it's just an example that I, comes to me. A lot of us have the experience maybe of visiting another church and even the greeters don't greet you, you know? I mean, and, and I've, people tell me, oh, I went to this church and 
nobody said hi to me and you know the greeters were there and the information booth didn't give me any information and you know that kind of a thing and I mean it's not the biggest thing in the world it's a first world problem that's what we call a first world problem you know that people weren't friendly enough to me at church um, and you can always you know you're always gonna find some sourpuss at some church and you know, maybe that other person, maybe it was their first time at church and they're just a sour person. How do you know? But sometimes, you know, there's, I, I remember going down, as a matter of fact, I have in a uh, situation like that. I was, I, was, I was the speaker at my friend Dennis Davenport's church down in Victorville one time as, as a men's thing. And I went down there and just, I even knew people down there and they didn't recognize me. And I just stood in line, got my meat, you know, it was like a meat on Monday kind of a thing. And, and uh, finally Dennis found me, but no one, no one said a word to me the whole time I was there. Uh, people who knew me, people who didn't know me. And then, uh, oh yeah, and I say, hey. And so, you know, but I don't care. I was, I was kind of fun actually, you know. I, I had a good time with it. It didn't bother me. Uh, and so, uh, but you, you, you can help people if you do notice them on the positive side. If you're, if you're greeting, greet. Uh, if you're, you know, so, I mean, you can tell, you know, our church isn't that big. You can tell if somebody is new, uh, you know, sometimes by the way they're dressed, uh, you know. And uh, it, it, anybody with a tie uh, is new uh, and <laughs> probably needs to be talked off the ledge, you know, and stuff because... They're wondering why people aren't dressed up for church. And I don't want to make fun of that. But you know what I mean. You can tell. You can tell if people are walking around the courtyard aimlessly with children in tow, they don't know where kids go. Uh, and, and so, you know, maybe you don't either, but you know somebody who does. And so, you know, it is, it is nice to be greeted and to, you know, to be noticed to a certain point. I mean, we don't make new people stand up and tell their life history and, you know, get their credit card numbers or anything like that and stuff. So, uh, but uh, just pay attention. Be attentive. A lot of ministry can take place if you're attentive. Jesus, you know, we just, the women on Monday night, they had the story of the women with the issue of blood. And Jesus, uh, you know, he knew that somebody had touched him, as, even though she was trying to secretly touch him and get out of it, you know, without making herself known. He said, oh, wait, stop. Somebody touched me. Power went out of me. I need to deal with this right now. So be an attentive person. Now, my goal throughout these studies in Esther is that you see God's providence at work without it violating anyone's free choices. Uh, and I, I think this is the great purpose, actually, of the book of Esther. Uh, you know, Mordecai says, hey, Esther, you've come to be the queen for just this moment, but if not, then God's going to still deliver people. And so they had a free will, personal choice, how to participate or not participate in this deliverance. Meanwhile, God was going to get his will done. I, I, the way I put it, God's will will be done, but we are not mere robots determined by God to act certain ways with no choices. In the end, it's best to agree with God, cooperate with him, go with him on it, uh, and be rewarded for it in the end, right? Right.